Welcome to the Scandinavian Mind podcast, our show about the intersection of lifestyle and technology, where we talk about the current trends and events within business, tech, fashion, design, culture, and more from the Nordic perspective of our team of editors and contributors. Today on the program, we take a look at some of the new developments in NFTs, including digital art that the buyer can be a part of. It's the light bulb man, a new work by Norwegian artist. Microsoft buys Activision Blizzard. What does that mean for the gaming landscape? We're going to dive into that. Also, we'll learn about what reverse logistics mean. Hint, it's about the dark side of retail. I'm Conrad Olsen, editor-in-chief and founder of Scandinavian Mind. And I'm here with my dear colleagues, Roland Philipp Kretschmar, editor-at-large for Future and Digitization, and our junior editor, Eric Sedin. Welcome, guys. Happy New Year. Woohoo! <laughs> back you. to be on the show. We're back. back. It's 2022. It's a new season of the podcast, a new year. This is, Super the, this is officially the first day of the year then. The this, is official, this is officially the first day of the, of the podcast year. <laughs> and let's just start with congratulating uh, Roland on your new day job. Ah, thanks. Yeah, that, it's, uh, it's very exciting. Let us know what you're doing so, so uh, we can keep an eye on it. Uh, well, in short, um, <clears throat> I am the new global head of digital marketing at Absolute Company, and that's the basically the, the brand company that uh, manages brands such as Absolute, Malibu, Kalu, and others. So yeah, pr- pretty iconic brand portfolio and very exciting role. Wonderful. Congratulations. But Thanks. naturally, your title as editor-at-large for Scandinavian Mind will remain at the top of your LinkedIn, right? <laughs> yes, always. And maybe we should just shorten the title. That's the new trend for 2022. Let's sh- have shorter titles. So just editor-at-large and then, you know, that that's good enough. Sure, sure. That's, that's fine. I'm, I'm good with that. Um, listen, guys, there's been so much talk about NFTs the past few weeks that it's it feels like Every brand, every industry took last year and just, you know, took a look at what happened. And now they're all launching their own versions, their own little projects. Uh, Just the last week, we saw uh, Adidas uh, announcing a collaboration uh, with Prada. Uh, Gucci announced an NFT project. Uh, There's just so much happening. And I think with regards to this podcast, I think we're just going to have to realize uh, that we're going to be talking about NFTs quite a lot because we're excited about it ourselves. It is something that's going to affect, you know, all the topics that we mentioned at the top of this show. Um, so let's just dive into it. Great. Yeah. Where do you want to start? I don't know. Uh, Roland, you've been, you know, keeping an eye on an, an art project that, that I thought was interesting. So let's, let's just start there. It's sure. today, right? Yeah, no. So, um, <clears throat> As you all know, I'm pretty excited about art, and I think, uh, I mean, obviously, if we talk about NFTs and the art space, there's been a lot of, you know, hype in the past uh, year. Um, but honestly, there's been, I would say, hesitance from the traditional art scene uh, when mm. it comes to NFTs. Uh, but maybe now, as of today, we're going to see something that could be um, kind of a front runner example of how traditional artists can enter the NFT scene in a smart way. So long story short, uh, there's a Norwegian artist called Bjarne Melgård. He is considered as you know one of Nor- Nor- Norway's uh, most uh, respected and successful uh, international artists. Um, he, he definitely, he, he, you know, he's exhibited at MoMA and others. You know, he's, he's, he's huge, basically, uh, in Norway, at least, and it's in other parts of the world mm. as well, maybe. Mm. Anyways. He has now um, launched this uh, project called The Light Bulb Man, which you can find on lightbulbman.com. Maybe in the show notes, we can add a link. <clears throat> it is launching today, right? As of 21st of January, 2022. So super fresh news. But why I like this is because basically uh, he, he's doing it in, in kind of a sequence, right? So... The NFTs uh, themselves will be launched today, as I said. Um, I think um, for the whitelist at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, this afternoon and for all others at 9 uh, p.m. in the evening uh, today. 
Uh, and uh, there's uh, 1,122 unique artworks launched. Um, and they are at the fixed price of 0.5 ETH. And if we look at the current price of ETH, it has dropped 10% tonight. I think you know it might drop even further. So actually, you can make a good deal, to be honest. Um, anyways, but what okay. I like is... That's the uh, time to buy some ETH, right? Uh, yes, <laughs> it's maybe, well, I don't we know. We don't I, give financial advice here on Scandinavian Mind podcast. Just a no, disclaimer. we don't. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. Um, but uh, what I like about this that, okay, so the, um, the NFTs are launched uh, this afternoon or tonight. But what already started yesterday on Decentraland, which is uh, like a metaverse space, uh, you can find that as well, Decentraland, uh, just Google it. Mm. It started with a 12-hour rave yesterday. So okay. in a specific space on Decentraland, there's a rave ongoing at the moment, courtesy of the light bulb man. Um, there were some, I mean, Prince Thomas is, is a huge Norwegian uh, electronics artist. He was DJ yesterday, you know, the, and there's a lot of people there kind of checking out the artwork signing up for for buying the nfts and and just hanging around maybe dancing in on the central mm. net right uh, so i i think that was quite interesting were, were in you itself. there yeah yeah I, I went to check it out um i had some um some time issues i could only be there for let's say uh, 50 minutes or so to were check you it virtually out. Yeah. dancing virtually dancing exactly um but then uh what's interesting in this first quarter let's say um you can then also name your own light bulb MAM that you, you, you might then purchase mm. on the blockchain. And that name then sticks forever, meaning that you can then, you know, personalize your, your NFT, basically. So you're buying an original Bjorn and Melgord piece of art, but at the same time, you can name your, your NFT and, and that name will stick on blockchain forever. So that's interesting. Then what will happen next is that... Um, he will launch uh, the NFT collection uh, physically and, and, and exhibit it in physical galleries across Scandinavia. And 10 selected NFT holders will also be awarded with an exclusive physical piece by Bjorn and Melgård of that NFT. All right. Yeah. And then there will be also a merch launched uh, during, during spring. Uh, and then... Um, there will be a lot of other things coming on, you know, during the rest of the year. Keep a long story short. I think this might be one of the best examples I've seen where a traditional artist enters the NFT space, kind of, you know, creates something exciting, new, sequential over time, uh, keeps the buzz, uh, energy, uh, and, and, and kind of uh, engagement over time, but in the mm. same time sticks to his, let's say, artistic integrity and um, does not, let's say, also aesthetically um, move too, too far into the, to the, let's say, pure digital art aesthetics. But, you know, you, you're basically buying a Bjorn Melgord. It just happens to be an F NFT in this case. Right, right. I think, I mean, you're really onto something here. And I think we're going to see uh, a sort of kind of a second wave of NFT art or in NFT projects during 2022. Uh, we are actually engaged in one in our, you know, the agency side of our business. We're helping uh, the guys over at uh, Picture This, which is uh, basically the, the founders of Fotografiska Photo Museum, uh, Jan and Per Bruman. They've launched a new digital platform for uh, photography. Uh, they just announced yesterday, actually, that that they're going to do um, NFTs as well. So, and just just to connect it to what you're saying, I, I think we're going to see. Um, the kind of the the legacy art world uh, we're seeing in fashion, sort of legacy brands like we just mentioned Adidas and, and Prada, moving into this space, creating kind of hybrid experiences. And as you just mentioned, also connecting it to uh, physical artworks. So uh, I don't know what, what this means, really. What, what do you think about the sort of, you know, if we define the first wave of sort of, you know, crypto punks uh, and uh, and uh, you know, bored apes. Uh, do you think those will fade away? Uh, you know, for for the, the the more traditional art world, is it is it time for the traditional art world to take over the NFT land? 
I honestly don't think that these kind of crypto punk, as you say, artists will disappear. I mean, there's a subculture for that. It's, it's uh, let's say, also generational, to be honest. Uh, if you're, uh, you know, 15 to uh, 25, you might be more excited about that kind of art and that art space. Um, but, you know, for o- old timers such as you and me, Conrad, uh, you know, we have grown up with a, a more traditional art scene. Uh, I think there is now a momentum where for the past year there has been a shock in the traditional art scene. Like, what the fuck is happening? And, uh, you know, and now they have had time to kind of contemplate, plan and analyze what, what role does the traditional art space have in mm. the metaverse? And, uh, you know, yeah, I think there's the momentum now. And I think, you know, I mentioned this kind of price drop in ETH and, and Bitcoin, et cetera. That will obviously wipe out as well um, a lot of these kind of uh, speculative elements of the NFT art scene. Uh, because um, all the, um, the signals that I hear is that it will continue to drop in 2022. There's going to be a huge wipeout in the crypto space. So obviously, all these uh, kind of uh, purely speculative artists and and traders and and flippers are going to be, you know, they're just going to disappear. So I think that's good. Right, right. Now, there's one thing that you mentioned that was sort of the connection to the sort of first wave of NFTs with the board apes is is the connection to identity, and and we've seen that you know people are using their sort of uh, uh, you know the, the 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 collectible avatars as their uh, you know, Twitter uh, uh, profile picture. Mm-hmm. I think there's all, there was some uh, buzz around. I think last week where Twitter was announcing that the there, you you can sort of connect. Uh, you know, there's the you know about the blue check mark where you can sort of verify your name on, on Twitter. Now you can also somehow verify your NFT. So so uh, there, there's a stronger connection between uh, the avatar that you're using and that the, the fact that you're actually owning the NFT. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but in the case of Melgard, you, you, there's there's some kind of co-creation happening. Is it was it only the name, or, or could the user also affect the the look of the the artwork? No, no, or only the name. Okay. And I think this is again, yeah, that's an interesting uh, point to bring up here. So, I mean, you would say a traditional artist would not allow you to interfere with the with the art piece itself. Uh, I mean, it depends, right? Performance art is different, etc. But a traditional painter would normally paint a painting and that's it, right? Mm. <laughs> it's it's a, f- a f- finite product. Um, but yeah, you might be onto something here. Uh, well, in this case, obviously, it's only the name you can affect, but we might see traditional artists coming into the, art see- uh, the NFT space and allowing much more of kind of personalization of the art piece itself. Then the question is, what happens then to the... I mean, how do you define what art is and who is the let's say the the artist in this case but maybe i mean i'm just quickly thinking about this i have i wasn't prepared for this question in the renaissance we had uh, you know uh, artists such as michelangelo etc i mean they had huge uh, studios like hundreds of of, of uh, pupils and and, and assistants uh, helping out to paint the paintings uh <coughs> carve the sculptures we still consider them as Michelangelo, even if they might have been, right. you know, f- fully painted by someone else, <laughs> right? I think Andy Warhol he had the same kind of uh, setup. Uh, I mean, even other yeah, Coons, Jeff artists. Coons has a big studio, yeah. right, with like exactly. hundreds of employees. And Damon Hurst. I mean, yeah, when I think about it, quite a lot of them work in this way. So, but then at the end of the day, if you buy Damon Hurst today, even if it's been like say ninety nine point nine percent painted by an art, uh, an assistant. You're still buying this finished kind of Damien Hurst signature yeah. piece of art. I don't know in the NFT space. Um, yeah, but I, listen, I don't have any answer. Good, good question. Let's see. Let's keep but an eye on I, it. I think. I, I, I think. I just want yeah, to add something there regarding yeah. the name there. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you guys know more about traditional art or whatever. But regarding the name, let's say Kanye West buys one of these light bulb NFTs, and he, you know, he can be quite outspoken, quite controversial. So he names it something completely crazy. You know, like maybe some uh, profanity or something. Maybe just Kanye or like Yay. Like that's what he names the the art that might add to the value i don't know if like the name of painting sometimes and name of art can like add to the art i don't know if it's been like that historically but yeah that could be something genius 
That's a good. <laughs> that that was a really really good additional element, especially when we talk about the value of the piece. So, yeah. I mean, I think when it comes to profanities and stuff, it, just Google Bjarne Melgård, you, you'll see. He, I don't think he will care. <laughs> He's pretty extreme, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you're right. If, if, if a famous person buys the art piece, names it after himself or herself or something else that creates a buzz around the naming, that could then increase the price, the second, the second hand market price for that specific art piece. Hmm. Of course, good, also good. The, the, the cultural, you know, status of it. The cultural might, status, people, yeah. people just know it as Kanye West's piece, not like the original painter or whatever. So who's the owner? Like you said, who has the, like, uh, the cultural ownership of the piece? Uh, well, I have not seen, though. I check again, but I, well, I haven't seen if there's some sort of vetting process for the naming. Because I mean, you could you could flip it also. You could say that brands could buy the art pieces. Yeah, yeah, of course. So Prada could buy one, or Adidas, or you know. I think with, have, board uh, ape, with board the board ape ones are actually uh, letting go of their copyright. So whoever owns it owns the copyright. And I've seen. I think there are examples of people using them as logos for their businesses, or they're mm. like they're naming coffee shops and so forth after their 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 uh, NFTs. Uh, maybe there's. It would be interesting to see what happens here with with uh, Melgord. If if uh, you know, uh, commercial entity buys it and and uh, you know renames it to uh, kind of a business or. Hmm. Let's see. No, but listen, listen. I, 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 Conrad, you and I, we discussed this. We definitely want to deepen our our. Um our observations of the art scene the, during this year so um, to be continued i would say to be continued and also i can i can just add on this topic i wrote a piece online on scandinavianmind.com two weeks ago about i don't know if you guys heard about art value uh, the project art value yeah where the winning bid of the art is the actual art so let's say you us three we we, we go to like a, yeah like a digital auction and the art is not created yet. We just bid whatever. And let's say the winning bid is five or six or seven. Then the artist creates art that is a seven. He makes like a cool seven with like some cool uh, colors or whatever. So the winning bid actually creates the NFT art that you then own. So whatever mm. the number is, that's the art that you buy. So kind of like this, how the, uh, the buyer and the purchaser kind of affects the actual art. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I mean, let's continue to investigate, uh, observe and, and study what's happening in the art scene is in this space. And actually, maybe next week, I want to bring up, um, there's an exciting company that um, wants to become the leading market space for AI generated art. So mm. yeah. All right. To be continued. Yep. All right, moving on. There's been a lot of chatter in the gaming space uh, over the last few days. Uh, Microsoft announced that they're uh, buying, or at least they're uh, trying to acquire Activision Blizzard for what is it, Eric? Is it seventy billion dollars? Uh, Give us the, yeah, the rundown of this story. It's uh, just shy of that. It's sixty-eight point seven billion US dollars for Microsoft to buy Activision Blizzard. And, you know, just to put this in like a kind of Scandinavian perspective, that's 12% of Sweden's GDP. And <laughs> so it's a lot it. of money. I don't know. You probably know about this, uh, Roland, better than I do, but like general acquisitions that's been huge throughout the years, but like se almost $70 billion. It's a lot for me. But in the gaming world, this has never been seen before. This is like, it's the biggest acquisition ever. Well, it's also the biggest uh, acquisition Microsoft ever. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. and that says a lot, you know. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because, yeah, we don't get Microsoft. money for Apple as a side note, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I read on, uh, on it's a very the biggest like gaming subreddit on Reddit is called it's just called Reddit slash gaming R gaming. And one user there, he put it quite nice. He said, this is basically like Netflix buying Disney Plus and HBO Max. <laughs> so imagine like one player just owning everything yeah. or like the two biggest ones at least. And uh, for me, at least, like I'm, this might age horribly, but I've like put out like two major things that I take away from this, and uh, this is first of all, is this the cost of getting a piece of the metaverse by you no know, this kind of money? So you know, the metaverse has taken its first tumbling steps or whatever through gaming, whether we like it or not. It's that's where the first things happening, I think, culturally at least. 
And for Microsoft, one of the biggest tech companies, if not the biggest in the world, a great way to, you know, access tens of millions of gamers and to get a hold of their culture and online and gaming culture and then sprinkle in some in real life culture. And, you know, that's through Activision Blizzard, I think, because these, like, like I said, it's like, it's like Netflix buying Disney Plus and HBO's Max. There are so many users, active monthly users on these two platforms or in, uh, because, you know, uh, Activision Blizzard, they have one of the, like the biggest franchises, like Call of Duty, uh, World of Warcraft, like the pioneer in online gaming identity or whatever, uh, but also Candy Crush, uh, which is <laughs> the, a game that anyone, everyone has basically played and, you know, gaming can take place on consoles or on right. PC, but mobile right. is also very big. And uh, so, yeah, I think for Microsoft to get into this uh, and by doing this, they're paying a lot of money, but, you know, they will get access to skins and merch and competitions in these uh, gaming platforms. But also like the metaverse culture thing that we've seen before with concerts and, you know, like this in-game uh, identity twin thing like this mm. uh, parallel uh, universe but that's like the first thing i think about like this is microsoft way of officially well, not, entering I, the metaverse i'm gonna actually push back on that i'm not sure that is the case here it could be but i think mm -hmm. it <clears throat> kind of like an easy way to make a headline is talk about you know various tech companies entering the metaverse with with various alliances and taking taking use of, of sort of gaming I mean, we should note that Microsoft is a big player in gaming already. They have like, a, you know, a, a specific CEO that ha heads up this stuff. They own the Xbox console. Uh, mm -hmm. They have a bunch of, of, you know, investment in this already. Uh, so I think from what I've heard about this, there's no strategic, uh, you know, maybe there are things happening behind the scenes that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. and we do, But we do know that Microsoft has... Uh, talked about getting into a metaverse-like spaces, but that has been on the uh, enterprise side or, or yeah. on the uh, sort of Microsoft Word, Microsoft uh, the Office side yeah. of things. Um, we, well, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. But but to me, it sounds more like they want to you know uh, advance into gaming and get a better grip on it rather than developing sort of metaverses. I don't know what what do you say about that? That's good. That's basically takes me into my second point of how you mentioned Xbox, one of the biggest or most recognizable consoles. Mm. But the thing is, Xbox is kind of struggling if you compare it to PlayStation. PlayStation is way more popular internationally. I think Xbox only has 35% of the market share in gaming control, PlayStation uh, gaming consoles. Yeah. And PlayStation has the rest. So, of course, Microsoft, they're huge in gaming. But the thing also is, I think... PC gaming, like most gamers, they're on PCs. Mm. Uh, you know, gaming console, that's more of a social thing. You sit down with a friend or your partner and stuff, but the most gamers, they're on, on PCs. And I think this is where Microsoft really wants to enter. And by going for uh, Blizzard Activision, this is where you get a huge chunk of gamers internationally. And uh, my second point that is in uh, Xbox, they have like a Game Pass, uh, which PlayStation does not. And this is quite unique to, I think this is where Microsoft is uh, getting at with this. So it's 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 an overused comparison, but it's, you know, we, all, we always say it's like the something, something of Netflix or something, something of Spotify, but the Game Pass is the gaming, gaming version of Netflix or Spotify. You pay a monthly fee and you get hundreds and hundreds of games. Right. Adding these games like Call of Duty, World of Warcraft, all these huge, huge games with, many more players than PlayStation and Xbox could ever dream of. They're really entering this kind of space. And this is, like like, like I said before, they can sprinkle some IRL in real life culture into the gaming culture for real this time. So what's the what, what are the what's the reaction on Reddit? What, what are gamers saying? Are they positive about this or are they, you know, worried? Uh, I, probably I should mention, we know Activision has gone through they've had a lot of bad headlines in, in like in this kind of post me too space. So people are, are they, they have had a huge problem with that and more bad working habits and stuff. So people are, they, they're like, Oh, we're not going to forget about how Activision is at the terrible, terrible company for developers and stuff. So people are not forgetting that they don't want to say like, let's not, you know, brush everything over. It's still a bad. So people are still quite mad at Activision over that, but then people are, also, like some people are saying that gaming has kind of lost its soul already. People think gaming has been too commercialized already. 
you're saying like, oh, I'm only playing in the in the developed games, anyways. This this doesn't bother me, but you know, it's a lot. Of course, it's mixed reactions. Let's say we're all into movies and Netflix studios. They they buy Disney Plus and HBO Max, mm. and we don't really like Netflix. We don't like the way they make movies. We don't like their series. Of course, it's going to affect everything. But I'm seeing. Yeah, some I, think, I, I, feel, I feel kind of sorry for the gaming community because I think there's <laughs> going to be a lot of focus on gaming, you know, in the coming year or so uh, because of these the you know the developments of, of metaverse and the sort of interest in virtual worlds. Uh, gamers, yeah. uh, you know, I think if you just broadly see gamers throughout culture, they they kind of been the nerds of culture, right? Uh, they're they're the they're not sitting by the cool table where you know you know music and movies has had culturally a you know bigger status, but yeah. gaming has surpassed you know those fields you know it's years ago. Uh, I think we talked about that in the last episode. How much gaming, uh, you know the 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 turnover of of gaming is 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 huge, right? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, for Call of Duty, I think. The, the turnover of Call of Duty is still like, you know, one of the bigger Marvel movies on their opening week and their opening week. They're doing that every week, <laughs> you know, year after yeah. year. Yeah. Um, but so I think there's going to be a lot of focus on gaming. I saw another story just, uh, you know, I, I don't know how this relates, but I think it relates to how we, you know, kind of uh, abuse gamers in a way, uh, you know, with the with the developments of NFTs and and the talk about owning, you know, digital assets. Obviously, the the comparison was like you, you know, if you buy like a weapon or something in a game or or a skin or something, you're not going to be able to use it as an NFT. There was this really interesting article in New York Times the, the other week about how gamers are revolting. Uh, to this development, like they're they're protesting uh, um, about games, you know, you know, infusing their games with NFTs because they're basically sick of these sort of microtransactions. Uh, it's been super commercialized. They, they are asked to pay over and over. They pay for the game and then they have to pay for the skin and for the weapon and for the next level and what now. Now they're going to have to pay for an NFT as well. <laughs> uh, so there, there's something interesting happening here. And I, I'm wondering if, if you know, obviously, if, if there's a new sort of underground world of gaming that's going to grow out of this, uh, you know, if, if it gets sucked up to these big tech conglomerates. You know, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm, I'm sure, you know, Facebook would love to buy you know one of these bigger gaming companies uh maybe like epic there were there were rumors about that if they can well there's a lot of uh, talk about antitrust or antitrust issues uh, relating to this and i'm you know i'm not even facebook has a lot of uh, uh they have their eyes on them from from regulators in the states and they're not they probably won't be able to buy as much but they're kind mm. of you know they're buying a lot of these sort of vr companies uh, uh around that but but um so it's going to be really interesting to see where this plays out. Uh, but I can, you know, in, in some, I kind of feel sorry for gamers. They're going to be be in the middle of this, in the thick of this. I have a my brother. I know he listens to this sometimes. He might. Uh, I know he's been he's been really telling me about how it's almost like a digital cultural appropriation of people just coming now to gaming. Where these we us gamers, we've been doing this. We've been in these dark rooms for decades, and now these. Like beautiful and <laughs> Harry's own, like Louis Vuitton comes in and just takes, you know, takes the cakes and eat it too. Digital uh, cultural appropriation, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you said, they were we weren't sitting at the cool table in a way. Uh, no, you know, and now people are coming here to just like take take what they can and just leave mm. with mm. money. So it's interesting what you're saying there. Some, of course, it's there was all it's started as a subculture. So of course, there will always be subculture that. Uh, you know, Microsoft and Activision Blizzard will never even touch, you know. Okay, we'll see how much Scandinavian mind will be guilty of digital cultural appropriation with regards to gaming in the future. I think we're still going to keep an eye on it. Uh, thank you, Eric, uh, for that story. All right, moving on. I, I want to end with a story uh, that I kind of picked up over the holidays. Uh, you know that, you know, when you have time during Christmas, uh, you have time to read sort of the longer stories of, uh, and, and for me, that's picking up a copy of The New Yorker or The Atlantic. Uh, in this case, there was a story in The Atlantic about the topic of reverse logistics. Guys, do you know what reverse logistics mean? Uh, no, please educate please us. Tell. Please do tell. So I haven't heard about this term uh, uh, before, but basically it's about 
uh, the concept of of sending back goods. Sort of in in the world of e-commerce, uh, people are buying stuff. They're getting it home. Uh, in 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 the world of fashion, people are maybe buying uh, several sizes, which become a, sort of a popular uh, way of doing it. But then they have to send this stuff back. And there was a long article in in the Atlantic, which is actually open, so we can link to it. It's a very very interesting article talking about really the dark side of what this means. So there are estimates that last year U.S. retailers took back more than a hundred billion worth of merchandise uh, from e-commerce consumers. So let's just, let's let's just let that sink in. One hundred billion worth of merchandise that it's sent back. So if we talk about the sort of environmental impact of uh, e-commerce, it, it, this is just a staggering uh, number, and. None of this is, uh, it's not regulated at all. And, uh, you know, companies in terms of their, their uh, yearly statements or the sustainability reports, uh, they don't have to disclose how much is sent back. And in the article, they're also kind of, uh, you know, grasping for, for knowledge because companies do not want to talk about this. They don't want to disclose, you know, just the fact that people are sending stuff back. It's not a good, good for business, right? Uh, but, you know, they're, they're going into detail, talking about all the work that goes into sending something back, just, you know, just just taking it back for a, a big fashion brand or a tech brand or whatever, just, you know, unpacking it, uh, inspecting it to see if it's been used. Um, and there was estimates that, you know, uh, an online return typically could cost a retailer around like 10 or $20. So... It you know goes without saying if you are a fast fashion brand for instance and those are the ones that really have been sort of pioneering you know buying several sizes and then sending them back it's obvious that they're losing money uh, on this and uh, the the dark side of it is uh, that the, the the goods that are sent back are probably not going back into circulation uh, going to the point of sort of overproduction uh, specifically in fashion. That's crazy. I, I can just add, uh, speaking of on this fact, I have friends and I have people that I know, you know, some online stores, they have free shipping from the get-go, like mm. what, how much you get, it doesn't matter how much you buy, you get free shipping, but some people have like spend over $50 and you get free shipping. So I know people, they, they add stuff to the basket just to get free shipping. Yeah. <laughs> and when they get it, they send it back because they're going to get the money back anyways. So they add stuff <laughs> into their shopping basket just to send it back to get free shipping. I think I saw some figures with Zalando banning 15,000 customers that yeah. were kind of systemizing these uh, these returns. So basically ordering, you know, hundreds of pieces um, a month even and kind of just mm -hmm. returning them. So they basically order, uh, maybe take pictures uh, of them in the different outfits, publish on <laughs> Instagram, <laughs> and then they send yeah. everything back. Yeah, or even just using the, the, yeah. the stuff uh, and, and just... Uh, sending it back after 30 days or whatever some some of these e-commerce sites have pretty generous uh, return return policies it was also estimated that five to seven percent of the returns was just write out fraud people sending back not they, they're not even sending back the, the the goods they're sending back like rocks or stones or <laughs> other things that, and, and just automatically via the system they, they get the money back uh, okay so so conrad i think this this topic is definitely fascinating and scary and uh but how much of this can be, for example, seen in uh, sustainability reports? I mean, of this reverse logistics problem, is this something that is transparent in sustainability reports? Not at all. And that was kind of the point with the article. And that's what they're landed in is that the, the, there's very little in terms of regulation. Uh, this, is, this is about sort of uh, practices in the world of e-commerce and in the world of consumer goods that is uh, unregulated. There's no real rules. And it seems like the, the brands are doing everything they can to hide this in their reports. So what the article is kind of calling for, they're not saying it outright, but this is what I'm thinking, is that this needs to be a part of what 
uh, brands like H&M and other retailers should be disclosing. You know, again, going back to the first number, 100 billion worth of goods a year are sent back. Uh, uh, this is obviously a huge problem, which relates to overproduction and other other sort of uh, macro issues uh, with retail. So, I mean, if, if anything, it should be something that brands uh, should disclose. That's a way, another way to handle it. We should have, we should talk more about uh, sort of consumer behaviors. Uh, that this this is not okay. This puts a strain on on the environment. So it is something that that's interesting. And I think a, a lot of this goes back to uh, we, we need new technologies. There are some new companies coming out of Sweden, and I know there are some talks happening at at the upcoming fashion weeks at at SIF and Stockholm. Uh, um, or in Copenhagen and in, in Stockholm, they're going to talk about new technologies that are helping brands and helping consumers uh, find a better way of, of streamlining, you know, kind of boring stuff like supply chain and, 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 and logistics. But these are kind of the topics that we really do need to talk about to, to solve some of the big sustainability issues. It's, it's not, you know, just about the materials and the, the in terms of production uh the way we send stuff and the way we send stuff back is is a huge issue all right guys first show of the year uh I'm super excited about being back we've done over half an hour so it seems like we have stuff to talk about uh roland what are you looking forward to in in, in the week to come well, let's bring it back to art. Uh, so there's two uh, really interesting exhibitions uh, starting this week in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, one at Gallery Magnus Carlsson, where it's a, it's a group exhibition. Daisy Paris, one of my favorite artists, and many others are exhibiting. So go to Ma Gallery Magnus Carlsson. The second one is at CFL, also a group exhibition with uh, one, another favorite artist, Connie Meyer, and others exhibiting Worth a Visit. Wonderful. And I just want to add to that on the on the art side, the photography art, as I mentioned, we are working with the new uh, uh, the newly started photography platform picture this. Uh, we're, we're super proud to be a part of that, helping them with their editorial. You can now go on there and buy your own fine art print of Christer Strömholm's uh, iconic Bleka Damen, uh, which uh, you, Eric, uh, we, you helped write the, the, the editorial about Bleka Damen. Yeah, the the pale lady. I think that's the official English uh, translation. Swinglish there. <laughs> yeah, well, that's 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 the that's the charm of this podcast. But yeah, an amazing story uh, made by iconic and internationally renowned uh, photographer Christer Strömholm. Uh, and I had to just deep dive into his past, and I had to call his son and get some great info on this uh, quite mysterious and iconic picture and how it came to be. Really interesting. All right. This has been the Scandinavian Mind podcast. Uh, just a note to say that we will be expanding on uh, the way we uh, document this podcast. We're sending out the newsletter today with all the links uh, to stuff that we've talked about. Uh, don't forget to sign up to our newsletter. Visit ScandinavianMind.com slash newsletter not to miss a story from Scandinavian Mind. Until next week. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. See you.